Mr. Christian, welcome to Bangalore. I'm not going to bore you with any more traffic and AI jokes because we've done those to death. But, uh, but I'm glad that you managed to just about get here uh, in, in time. You know, we were having this fascinating conversation on uh, uh, what AI could potentially do as far as the chess world is concerned and sport in general. Let me start by asking you about how AI can transform government and government decision making and where things currently stand. We've gone from an era of the Nadaiwala file now to an AI era. What does it mean as far as the government's own working is concerned? You know, quite honestly, uh, there's one area clearly where it can help. A lot of what government does is based on precedent and finding the right precedent. And I think that's certainly something that AI can do for us and probably with greater accuracy than human memory. So is it, is it something that you are considering at this point in time as part, as part of the larger aspect and ambition and aspiration of the AI mission? Uh, we have started small pilots, definitely. And definitely in my own ministry, there are uh, a couple of smart young scientists who have started out some of the work that we do. For instance, answering parliament questions and so on to figure out what has happened in the past, because many questions come up again and again, just to make sure that we are consistent. So we are using it. You know, we were having a conversation this morning where uh, there were parallels being drawn on uh, what is happening, for instance, in the UAE. And there's actually a Ministry of AI and a Minister of AI there. And uh, the government has decided to focus on healthcare as the primary sector where they intend to focus on the transformative impact as far as AI is concerned. Do you believe that that is something that uh, we could possibly or we should possibly consider here as well? Uh, about a Ministry of AI? not my brief, it's above my pay grade, so I'm not going there. But on focus areas and areas that would make a significant difference, healthcare is certainly amongst the three or four critical areas that we would look at, healthcare, education, agriculture, climate change related work, and how we can support manufacturing. These would be the four or five areas which we think are critical where AI can be used and ought to be used in India, and we need to be developing that. And in terms of government's own functioning, the complexity of India, and in terms of enabling more people to actually access government services, using voice-based services which can operate in multiple languages. We have Bashini right now. We have other efforts going on. I think uh, uh, you have a session later today. I see uh, Professor Ganesh uh, in, the, in the audience. So that would be another area which is critical and important in order to make AI work for the people of India. Well, speaking of making AI work for the people of India, I, I want you to give us a status check, and I'm sure everyone here in the audience, as well as those watching us on TV and online, are curious to know where do things currently stand now as far as the AI mission is concerned. We do have a capital plan and a capital allocation of a little over 10,000 crores, and I know that you've told me previously that capital is not an issue. If more money needs to be put on the table, the government will put more money on the table. But where do we stand now in terms of operationalizing the mission? What has been achieved? As you're aware, there are seven major pillars, and the work is going on apace on all of them. Uh, the, most, the largest pillar is the compute pillar, which is uh, 4,500 plus crores. And uh, on the compute pillar, end of this month is when we open the bids. Uh, 28th of November is when we open the bids for the first round of AI compute. Uh, we've had very, very uh, good response. We've had a number of rounds of uh, pre-bid consultations and meetings with uh, all the stakeholders, and we are very hopeful that it should lead to very good outcomes. Mm. And that is fundamentally based on the principle that uh, there would be bids as to at what rate different kinds of services relating to AI would be offered, and we hope that by buying in bulk and by assuring a market, we would be able to get reasonable prices. If for certain specific needs like research or innovation or something, we need to subsidize this or government needs to pay for that, that is something we can certainly do. So that is the big chunk which um, work is already on and we should be able to push and go forward. Uh, the other element is the skilling element where there's been considerable um, response. 
uh, we have almost about uh, 350 projects at uh, the BTEC and MTEC level, which we have picked up and we would be, um, we are examining right now for funding and more are coming in as we speak. Um, likewise, there have been about 14 institutions which have come up with proposals for uh, funding PhD scholars uh, in the AI space. So the skilling piece there is really falling into place. And what's place. the capital allocation as far as the skilling piece is concerned? Skilling piece is about overall for the five years, it's about 1900. Okay. So it's a fairly big chunk. And uh, the, third, uh, the third area where there's a lot of interest is on AI applications. We finished one call for proposals. Uh, there have been, again, overwhelming uh, response on the number of, uh, number of people who have responded. We are opening up the second call in December, and we expect that more would come up. And in the meantime, these calls and these responses are being evaluated by a committee of experts. Likewise, for uh, safe and trusted AI, um, there's been uh, a lot of action on that front, and uh, uh, we've found a number of people, almost a thousand responses in, uh, for various kinds of applications which would enable us to make AI more safe and trusted. So practically on every uh, pillar, there's considerable progress. Uh, the two pillars which we are yet to fully operationalize, one is the AI application, I mean, I'm sorry, the AI, um, the, the new multimodal model which we want to create. Okay. We are thinking through that aspect. And um, the, third, the last one, of course, is on how we support uh, innovators and startups. But that, again, we will start in the coming months. Okay, uh, so a couple of uh, things that you spoke to us about. Uh, uh, let me pick up on, on something that you said there, that you hope that the government will be able to extract reasonable pricing. Do you believe that uh, given uh, the, uh, the demand that you hope to be able to generate, uh, uh, that you will be able to exercise uh, pricing power there and drive down prices? I don't think we are seriously looking to drive down prices to cause losses to anybody. I think this is more about offering a level playing field. You know, you can, a government program to subsidize this can operate in a number of ways. Uh, if we get into actually trying to establish it ourselves, mm. there is one issue. There are efficiency issues, the speed with which you can do it. If you want to subsidize the private sector to do it, we could have done it. We could have done a viability gap fund and allowed somebody to do it. The only issue there was that people had already started establishing and some people had already established GPU capacity, then they would be excluded. Mm. And really the capacity which we can actually bring into use the earliest will be excluded from the scheme, which is why we prefer to go with this option to begin with, saying let us give uh, a wide option whether you've already established it or you intend to establish it in the near future. Mm. Here's some visibility on the kind of demand that we can offer you. And here's some uh, way in which you can bid for this. So I think that is why we picked this as our first foray. It still doesn't mean that we can't do a viability gap fund uh, if needed. Uh, basis if needed. And equally, a sovereign option is always there under the um, uh, national supercomputing mission. We are already converting the later stages of that program into AI-based compute in addition to just uh, high-performance compute. So we have both those options built in. And uh, there is on the anvil uh, uh, an NSM2 will have to mm. come in because we mm. have to go to exascale computing. So that is down the line. So we can always use those levers to actually uh, increase or expand the scope of AI computing. Uh, you know, that's interesting, and, and, and let me ask you this. We've got the AI mission, we've got the semiconductor mission, we've got the compute mission, all three underway parallelly. Uh, you know, uh, how much of integration is actually going on in the manner in which these three are being architectured as well as being executed? Because I would imagine that there's a fair degree of overlap as well. There is certainly some overlap. I wouldn't say that uh, there is considerable overlap. I think the semiconductor mission is really looking at two parts. One part is commercial, uh, commercial ready technology which can be implemented. So that is a fairly uncomplicated thing. It is people who have technology who will come and establish commercial scale production facilities with a government subsidy. It's a fairly straightforward uh, ask. 
There's another part to the um, supercomputing mission which relates to the design-linked incentive where we are actually subsidizing startups and other companies also now. We will also add domestic companies to that list uh, for their uh, designing new uh, uh, chips and chip designs and so on. We provide a subsidy. Now, that portion in some senses has some overlap with what happens with AI. Some of those chips could be AI-based chips. Mm -hmm. Some of it could be differently architectured. So there is some potential there. But we don't have a similar um, vertical in right. the AI mission. Now, likewise, in the AI mission, the fundamental push is on making sure that, you know, the compute is made available for people to use, to develop applications, to even develop a large multimodal uh, model, all of that. Hmm. So it is not so much oriented towards the hardware side of things. The national supercomputing mission, on the other hand, is purely a uh, an exercise in developing domestic capacity um, where we first develop the technology in CDAC, in the in Indian Institute of Science, in the IITs, and once that technology is developed, we partner with uh, the private sector to actually build out. Mm. And there are companies who are building today servers, high-performance servers in the country based on technology that has been done by uh, um, uh, CDAC. Uh, you have uh, in Karnataka itself uh, Keynes Technologies, yeah. you have uh, uh, NetWeb, you have VVDN, all of them are making servers, mm -hmm. um, Rudra servers as they are called, Rudra Shavak servers, and very soon they will even be in the market and people would be buying them. You know, let me pick up on that last point that you spoke of. Uh, do you believe that we're on the cusp of seeing a renewed breakout as far as hardware is concerned? I mean, we're, you know, you gave us some examples of what is happening, for instance, on the server side. We've, of course, seen what the PLI has done on the mobile, uh, etc. side. We've now got a scheme for laptops. Do you believe that we're probably on the cusp of uh, a revival of the hardware story? Absolutely. I think... Uh this has been part of the objective of the national uh, policy on electronics ever since 2012 and it's got a new impetus now to make sure that uh, with with very meaningful and uh, muscular schemes which will help us bring in electronics manufacture within the country um, we are all aware of the success of the uh, mobiles uh, pli uh, which has actually meant that from uh, a country which imported 75% of its uh, mobile phone requirement in 2014-15, today we export, and 99%, 99.2% of what we need in the country, we make in the country. That's one part of the story. Equally, we believe that value chain has to be deepened, which is why we are working currently, which the minister has already mentioned, on the component uh, scheme which is being uh, discussed right now and should be out shortly, and that will deepen the value chain further. Is the component scheme likely to be announced ahead of the budget or alongside it the budget? Depends. It depends on you know, how much time. Uh, various things take, so I wouldn't hazard a guess there, but we will try and get it out as quickly as possible. <laughs> So that, that, uh, that will deepen the value chain on the electronic side and the PLI for IT hardware which has already been announced and has taken off with a fair amount of uh, participation by a number of companies, both multinational companies and domestic companies, 27 of them in all. And there, uh, there is a requirement of progressively indigenizing the value chain and uh, the domestic value add has to increase. We don't have a domestic value add condition in uh, the mobile phones PLI, but we do have it in the IT hardware PLI, and the companies have assured us that they will be able to achieve it, and we will move forward on that basis. So, uh, yes, uh, as they say in Hindi, aapke muh mein ghi shakkar, because <laughs> if we are able to revive the hardware uh, story... How the, confident do you feel about that? I think uh, I, I never felt better about uh, a possible industrial gamble, and this, I think, will work. I think more than anything else, uh, more than the government schemes and the money which are there, um, what I see is confidence. What I see through a number of uh, events and number of other occurrences, you definitely see confidence. One of the most notable events that way was the India Semicon event in September in uh, Greater Noida. 
um, what we saw from the CEOs who attended, everyone doesn't want to miss out on the India story. They want to make sure that they are here and they want to make sure that they make in India. So I think uh, we are quite confident that this time it should happen. Uh, you, you feel confident that this time it should in fact happen and I'll ask you uh, what bolsters that confidence. Uh, what we are seeing of course is also the geopolitical changes which have uh, pushed people to look at supply chain diversification, you could call it supply chain resilience, uh, what have you, but that is a reality and that's a factor that India can potentially and is potentially benefiting from. What more do you believe uh, we can do to make good of the current opportunity uh, that is on the table and potentially the opportunity that opens up now with the Trump administration in play as well as the possibility of more export controls, tariffs and so on and so forth? I think uh, you've, you've outlined all the important factors. The most important factor that everyone is looking at is a resilient supply chain. And that is in everyone's interest in a longer term perspective. So that is, that is what fundamentally underlies this, saying that you don't necessarily go only to the cheapest um, source of manufacture at all times. You want to preserve the resilience. You want to make sure that you have alternatives that you can pick up and go with. So that is something which, uh, which I think in the long term is what is going to sustain us. And especially since we are such a large market. And it's a growing market. Uh, the demand for uh, electronics uh, goods and products is going to keep going up. And this is a market into which many people will want to sell. Mm. So that is clearly what, well, what the longer term looks like. But even in the short term, um, the pandemic taught us that you can't rely on a single source and you should be prepared to pay a slight additional cost, which brings us to various other mechanisms. And if you're going to replace a country the size of China yeah. with an alternate destination where you can manufacture, you have to find another country which is somewhere similar in size. Well, you know, certainly similar, but not quite in the vicinity of being the same. But uh, let me also ask I you. Said size. Yeah, no, no, I, 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 I agree. I agree with you. But uh, even in size of the market, it's a very, very different uh, comparison. But Mr. Krishnan, let me also ask you uh, potentially about where we stand as far as the new development on the semiconductor side, the India-U.S. collaboration with the Prime Minister having visited the U.S. in September and uh, this uh, new agreement that the two sides have decided to ink. How close are we to? actually getting things off the, crown, uh, off the ground on that one? I think uh, there are two key elements here. As far as the semiconductor ecosystem manufacture is concerned, I mean, the lead was actually taken by a U.S. company. Micron yeah. is Micron, fundamentally yeah. a U.S. company, and they are the ones who got in first. So that is very, very significant and important. We have other uh, U.S.-based companies who are part of the semiconductor ecosystem, not necessarily chip makers, but other parts of the ecosystem who are also very keen on entering the India market and expanding more than entering, I think, expanding their presence here. And all of this is part of that conversation. But I think what is most significant is the trust element and the way the trust element is built up. Uh, the two examples which came out of or which were mentioned specifically uh, in the briefing note uh, after the uh, President Biden and Prime Minister Modi meetings were one of them actually relates to manufacturing for the defense, defense sector yes. in both India and the U.S. And I think that's a significant psychological milestone which has been crossed. And that would make a significant difference in the way that uh, um, we look at each other in this particular sector. And I see many, many opportunities opening up there. Well, uh, you know, let me ask you about the larger regulatory environment. And uh, we've gone through an era of countries across the world looking at data sovereignty. In India, we brought in the data localization norms uh, uh, in order for us to be able to protect data. And now we're talking about AI regulations. And the world over, this is something that people are grappling with. What do you foresee, what do you envisage as an AI regulatory regime that would be relevant to India, uh, that would uh, be relevant to India's needs in the future as well? You know, quite honestly, I think we have to think through this thing very carefully. You know, some of the problems or some of the issues that people talk about in the context of AI, especially deep fakes and so on, is not so much a regulatory issue as much as a technology issue and a timeliness issue. At best, it may need some tweaks to make sure that the response is faster mm. as opposed to a requirement to change the law 
fundamentally itself. So you're saying the law has enough teeth to deal with deep the fakes law, and misinformation and hate speech and absolutely. disinformation I mean, and all of that yeah. and make the platforms more accountable? M making the platforms more accountable and getting them online in terms of, well, in, in the sense that they're realizing and acting faster. I mean, I think that is what is uh, seriously required. The law has provisions which can enable that to be done. At best, we may need some minor tweaks. So I, I'm not very concerned that we don't have a law which will address that aspect. Mm. Um, the, the aspect which many people worry about and, you know, some of the, the California law which also got finally vetoed and things is one extreme existential end. I don't think we have gone there yet. And I don't think we should be legislating at that scale right now because I think we are still at an innovation stage mm. and we need, to, we need to recognize that we need to promote innovation. The other experience that we have found, uh, a positive experience in working with um, large social media intermediaries and others is that there's a fair amount of voluntary compliance yeah. to a number of aspects. If you look at uh, data which shows, you know, how many takedowns have been there and, you know, a couple of years ago everyone was after the government saying that you are forcing this and there's freedom of speech and things. Now nobody talks about those issues anymore. Hmm. People realize that there are risks and dangers to the community. And if you look at the number of takedowns, what government actually requires to be taken down is uh, an absolute minuscule fraction. Hmm. I think it is less than 0.1% of the total number. Uh, the reports by the social media intermediaries themselves will show that they take down a much larger number based on their own community guidelines and their own issues. So I think uh, we, can, we see that kind of cooperation. And the second thing is that invariably uh, it's an interactive process where we point out something where they've not taken it down yeah. themselves. They come back to us and there's a discussion and almost in every case the compliance is practically instantaneous. Mm. I mean, it's a, it's mm. a discussed process. It is a, um, it's not some very adversarial process in that sense. So I think looking at the track record of that kind of voluntary compliance and the willingness to recognize the risks, I would believe that, and uh, the, uh, the minister has already mentioned this, that we will look for a voluntary compliance uh, track to begin with and thereafter see whether there is a regulation which is required or legislation which is required. Because for government to legislate, it is the sovereign power of the government. We yeah. can legislate when we need to. But you don't want to stifle have... innovation is what you're saying. Uh, but, you know, in the context of AI specifically, and I think, you know, you talked about uh, precedence and precedence is what the government looks at. And we could have an interesting precedent playing out with the courts taking up the matter of ANI versus open AI, where essentially, uh, you know, the, the broadcaster or news agency is saying that you're using my content to train your models on. Is this, is this something, uh, an area that the government, uh, by way of that... regulation, will, will get into? There, that's a slightly different issue. I think that is a copyright issue. Yes, it is and, a copyright and, issue. I mean, and as members of the media, I think all of you should think about, you know, where your copyright yeah, absolutely. works. And so, you know, the copyright aspect is, is a separate aspect. Um, you know, it is two private rights which stand against each other. Now, do we ex extinguish one private right or do we extinguish the other? I think that is something which has to be decided judicially. And I think even in the United States, that's an issue which is being dealt with judicially. Yeah. So I think uh, we should be clear that we can always regulate, we can always legislate. But this is an area where there's existing legislation. We have uh, IPR legislation in this country. We have copyright legislation in this country. There are empowered courts who need to decide on those issues. So let the courts decide as on, far as on, on, that on, this, issue, issue on, on this issue of copyright, copyright violation. violation. Uh, let me get into the... And there is law already. Yeah, there is, there is law. Yeah, there is law. Let me get into the discussion and debate on whether India should invest its capital as well as its bandwidth on creating large language models and what we need to do in order to build out the AI infrastructure or should we really focus on the application side because that is our strength and that is where uh, we ought to focus our energies on today. You know, that there's, and it's a divided house. There are both points of view being expressed at this point in time. Where do you stand? I stand on the, on the wall, you know, I stand <laughs> literally on the fence on this. But no, I mean, on a more serious note, you have to recognize that there's a very carefully thought out pillar in the 
India AI mission, which deals with large multimodal models, not necessarily large language, language models. models yeah. And because we believe that there's a lot of, um, you know, oral uh, stuff, there's a lot of visual stuff, there are pictures, there are videos, there are recordings, and all of that which need to be taken into in order to generate a model which will really work for India and which will capture yeah. the diversity. So that is something which we have not ruled out at all. The money is set apart for that. We have to look at a good proposal which will sort of do what good needs to Good proposal from the private sector? Not necessarily, from academia also. I mean, there are proposals which academia is already uh, working on. Uh, they are already working on some of this already. And as it needs to be scaled up, if it needs... But funding, nothing's come for approval as of now? Not to us, but that is something which has been funded partly by DST. And we can always sort of increase the funding if need be and take it forward. So I think that option is not closed off at all. Okay. That option is very much open. But the point there is that there is some available material which we can use and support existing applications. And that's another separate pillar of uh, the India AI mission. So when I say that, you know, there are seven pillars and some pillars are firing faster, some pillars are taking their time, I think we are prepared for both. Oh. Uh, so, so what, what would tip you over the fence on, on this one? Evidence of, uh, of you know, proposals that come to you or? Not just evidence of proposals that come to us. We can, we can always think, I mean, you have to realize that across the world, in many of the AI models which have been developing, which are developing right now, uh, there are many people, many Indians, many people who have gone from here who are helping to develop many of those models. Now, what turns them to come back or what turns somebody of that same, uh, you know, brilliance or understanding and skill sets uh, wanting to do it here, we are happy to support. So, mm. I mean, it's an open offer. So that's, that's something which, which we are prepared to support at any time that a good proposal comes together for something which we can work on. So that will really tip us. So it's open. The pillar is there. We can fund it. It is not something which is closed off at all. And we also have to realize, I mean, we, you were asking, you know, what is the interplay between what happens in ISM and what happens in the AI mission. Uh, when you look at the um, India Semiconductor mission, you see there are two Tata projects. Yeah. One project is the FAB in yeah. Dolera, in which they have a technical partner who's working with them. The other one is the ATMP in Assam, where they're doing it themselves. And what have they done? They've simply hired a large number of uh, engineers and others, uh, technologists who have worked with leading companies across the world, uh, hired them and got them to develop the technology for themselves, and they're doing it. And their technology, I mean, the initial uh, proving ground or, you know, the pilot uh, project is just outside uh, Bengaluru. It's in uh, Vemagal. So there's no reason why it can't be done. Yeah, one of the things that I think, uh, you know, is, is being celebrated is the fact that uh, India continues to be the talent hub for the world and we're seeing large MNCs operate their largest tech centers globally here in India, uh, adding value and wealth. Uh, but does it concern you that the IPR is uh, not necessarily benefiting uh, India? Yes, certainly it does. I think... Uh uh, which is why the design linked incentive is sort of focused on making sure that the IPR stays in India. Uh, you know, there are a number of, this is the hotbed of uh, new startups, including in chip design. Uh, some of them grow, some of them want to stay Indian, some get sold, and or they just design for <coughs> companies. I mean, it is, it is a commercial decision that many of the owners and uh, I don't think you should be judging them on the basis of the decision that they take. When it starts making economic and other sense for them to do it for the country, I'm sure they'll do it. And um, I think that's something which, you know, when Indian talent is being used and 20% of the workforce which works on design is Indian. In India, And yeah. uh, Bangalore, Hyderabad, these are the big centers, Pune, these are the big centers where this is getting done. And I'm sure one day or the other, as that you know, as GCCs grow, as more people work on engineering R&D, as more people work on design, you know, there will be these offshoots, there will be companies which will be established and which will grow. And, you know, we are creating the ecosystem. So I am not, 
let me say that I'm not disappointed. I'm happy for the way that the ecosystem is growing. Yeah. I think it's only a matter of time before it happens for India as well. And we will have something which will support people who will develop the design in India and keep the IPR in India. Uh, Mr. Krishan, I want to link back to the hardware story that we were talking about and you said that you feel very confident that this could in fact be the breakout moment or revival so to speak. But I want to link this to what we're seeing happen within the region as well and you know the, the China opportunity is not just coming to India, it's coming to places like Vietnam and other countries in the region as well. Is there an assessment today of where things currently stand as far as costs are concerned, as far as ease of doing business is concerned, to ensure that a lot of that FDI that may be finding its way into other regions, uh, you know, moves to India? Look, I mean, there are, of course, there are higher costs, especially when a new industry comes in. There are likely to be higher friction costs and other costs which are there. And, uh, you know, infrastructure may not be what it needs to be to begin with. So all of those added costs will be there, but I think they do get overcome in course of time. I think these two states between Karnataka and Tamil Nadu have proved uh, what it takes to bring in electronic manufacturing into the state and how you can actually do it. Um, the proof is really in actually seeing it happen. Foxconn is building a huge uh, center again out, outside of uh, Bangalore and Tumkur. They already have one huge center in Sri Parambudur uh, in Tamil Nadu. So this is, uh, this is proof for you that it can actually be done. I think it's no longer a question of can we do it. Yeah. We have done it. Now how do you scale it up and how do you spread the story wider in the rest of the country? And how do you prepare for it? Have you been able to spread the story wider on the back of some of the examples that you just cited? And do you have clarity or visibility on further incremental or new FDI coming in? There are certainly, there is a lot of interest and I'm sure, I'm confident that more of it will come in. Um, it's a little more complicated. The electronic sector is a little more complicated than say, the automobile sector where the number of manufacturers is significantly larger. Uh, today, if you look at something like uh, the mobile phone uh, brands, there are probably only five or six big yeah. brands. Likewise, in uh, any particular element of consumer electronics or anything as uh, the leading brands and those who dominate most of the market are yeah. limited in number. So it is, it is a bit of a challenge, but I think the good thing is that many of the brands and many of their facilities are already in India. Mm. And it's a question of scaling up. If you take the mobile story, it's no longer about manufacturing for the country. It's about exports. It's about, you know, how much can you make here and export. So that is the way we are looking at it. Because otherwise, you know, the two biggest brands are both here and manufacturing. And one is exporting, the other will also hopefully start exporting. And even the, um, even the Chinese brands which are here will hopefully start exporting. Is, is the Apple story really the story that, uh, that is marketing the make in India uh, movement at this point in time? I think it's a very important example. I mean, if you show that it can be done, that makes a big difference. And I think what the Apple story really shows you is that it can be done. There's a very similar story in a related field. If you look at, you know, uh, athletic footwear, uh, the Nike story, for instance, in terms of what is happening with uh, non-leather footwear being made in India and the number of companies which are again coming up yeah. in this region. So I think these stories are illustrations that it can be done and uh, it just takes a little bit more work to sort of put it all together. How much of technology is a part of your life today? I mean, do you, do you have an AI assistant that's helping you uh, go between your meetings and, and uh, you know, prepare your notes for you and so on and so I'm, forth? I'm, I'm a slightly older world person, but I have people in my ministry and who help me. Who real are real people, savvy, real, real people. Real people who <laughs> tell me I asked uh, AI and they told me this and this is what you, this is the way it is. But I think uh, sometimes, you know, even if you have to think about technology and even if you have to think about these issues, I mean, I'm not a technologist myself, I'm a policy person. But when I think about policy, it's, I think, important to understand the real world impact of this and what it can do for a variety of things. So sometimes it's easier to think with this. So, uh, yes, I, I, I would imagine so. So let me end by asking you, what to your mind is 
the role and the purpose of technology in the Indian context for our future as you see it evolve? I think it is the most significant element that is what is going to really take us into the next level of discontinuous growth. Uh, technology in the way that it has evolved and particularly the application of AI and various elements of it will probably be the next industrial revolution and uh, the opportunity that the West had and Europe had with the first industrial revolution is the kind of opportunity that presents itself now and if we ride that wave and use technology appropriately then probably India by 2047 will be a rich country and not just an old country. A rich and an old country with young people. But Mr. Krishnan, always a pleasure. Many, many thanks for joining us here to give us a status check of where things currently stand with the India AI mission and much more. Ladies and gentlemen, Thank a big you. round of applause for Thank the you. Métis Secretary. Thank you so much for your time, sir.